Hello, my name is Kishwani. That's K E S H W A N R Kishwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the T's. We have been solving math problems out of this book here, the study manuals for the T's. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The problems that we're about to solve are the ones that you will find on page number 84. Please turn to it, page number 84, and today is our lesson number 34. Today we'll continue the topics that we talked about yesterday, which were ratio and proportions. Ratio, ratio and proportion. Now the two fundamental concepts, two fundamental differences rather, that we learned yesterday were that ratios deal with deal with light things. Proportions on the other hand deal with unlike things. Proportions deal with unlike things. And if I already lost you, if you do not know what the hell I'm talking about, that's a clear sign that you have not watched yesterday's video. Pause this video immediately. Make sure you watch yesterday's videos. Make sure you understand the difference between ratio and proportion before you attempt these problems. It's important to have intuitive understanding of the concept. Many, many a times I've seen people who go around assuming the ratio and proportions are one and the same. They are not, the term ratio and proportion are not to be used synonymously. They are not synonymous. Uh, synonymous. They are not synonyms. They are not synonymous. These are two different animals, entirely two different animals. Ratio we learn deal with like things, proportions deal with unlike things. The second thing that we learned yesterday is that ratios are, are unit free. Ratios are unit free. Proportions on the other hand must, must have units. Proportion, a proportion without, a, uh, without unit has no meaning. It has no meaning. If I come up to you and proudly tell you that my car gives me 30 per 2, if I come up to you and proudly tell you that my car gives me 30 per 2, you would say, what the hell? What does it mean? Your car gives you 30 per 2. Get out of here, you jerk. It has no meaning. It's nonsense. Now, on the other hand, if I tell you that my car gives me 30 miles, per two gallons, but well, now we're talking, now it's getting juicy. My car gives me 30 miles per two gallons. It must have units. Proportions must have unit. Ratios are unit free. Ratios have no units because the units cancel each other out from the top and the bottom because we're dealing with the same thing. We're dealing with like things. We're dealing with like things. We're dealing with similar things. Proportions deal with dissimilar things, unlike things. Anyway, enough of the talk. Let's do the problem, shall we? The very first problem that we're dealing with the very first problem that, that we have to deal with, that is, is the one that you see there on the top of the page, 2.39, 2.39, we're told that A reads 10 pages per hour, we are also told that B reads 18 pages per hour, we are told the 288 pages, 288 pages, 200, a total of 288 pages are to be read. By each, that is. Do you understand? And the question simply is, how much is going to be the difference in the amount of time that the two people are going to take? Well, let's find out, shall we? So here, here's our A. A is quite straightforward, actually. A is going to be very simple. He reads, he has to read 288 pages. He reads 10 pages per hour. As you can see, pages are going to drop out. Hour is going to end up on the top. 288 divided by 10. All you have to do is move the decimal place from here to here. So it's just going to be 28.8 28 hours. 28.8 hours. That's quite straightforward. A takes 28.8 hours, or approximately 30 hours if you like, if you're going to pretend that the book has about 290 pages, but that's pretty straightforward. Dividing anything by 10 is straightforward, you just move the decimal. Dealing with this guy, this is where you have to pay attention, so listen carefully. So here's your B. 
So to me, we are told it's 288 pages. I shouldn't have written like this because I know where I'm going with it. So here is the B part, 288 pages per uh, uh, he has to read and he reads 18 pages per hour. Now listen very carefully. As I always tell you, there are certain sermons, there's a certain, there are certain standard sermons that, that, that you've heard me uh, give uh, over and over again if you've been watching these videos from day one. And one thing that I always tell you is that it's okay to approximate in this exam. It is not only okay, but it's actually necessary. It's a skill that you have to master. Approximating is very important. Otherwise, you'll sit there trying to figure out every single problem uh, exact uh, the, the answer to every single problem in the exact proper manner that will take forever and ever. You will never get anywhere. Approximation is a necessity. But, here's the but part, but there is a clear difference. There's a fine line between approximating and going bonkers. It's okay for us to assume that 288 pages is the same as 290 pages and just give a quick answer that it will take about 29 hours. It's okay. It's perfectly fine. No harm done. But it is not okay, in my opinion, to go around saying that we're going to pretend that this is 20, uh, that, that he is going to read 20 pages per hour. That difference of 2 from 18 to 20 does not fall in the same category as assuming that 288 pages is approximately 290 pages. So the two different things here, we just increase the speed by 2 pages per hour. That's going to make a huge difference between, in the number of hours that it's going to take. And then you're going to go around doing the same thing here, convert this thing to some, some multiple of uh, 20. It doesn't work that way. These numbers, what you have to understand, these numbers, whenever you see weird numbers like this, where you ask yourself, should I really approximate uh, from 18 pages per hour to 20 pages? Should I just assume that his speed just went up by 2 pages per hour? I shouldn't. This is, this is, too, much, this is taking too, many, too much liberties. And if I did that, I'll be, I'll be going bonkers. I mustn't do it. And when you find yourself in that situation, pause and ask yourself, is there something Is there something in these numbers? These numbers, if they look very weird, they're there for a reason. The people who write these exams, people who write these questions, are quite rational, logical, intelligent people. These numbers are there for a reason. Let's see what we can do with them. Let's shall we? Shall we? Let's try it. Enough of the talk. Well, first thing we notice is that they're both even numbers. So let's divide top and bottom by 2, shall we? If we divide top and bottom by 2, 18 is going to give us 9, 2 is going to give us 1, this is going to give us 4, this is going to give us 4. That's it, very simple. Obviously, we can no longer divide by 2. Once we cannot divide a number by 2, because 9 does not divide by 2, once we cannot divide by 2, we ask ourselves if we can divide top and bottom by 3. And we have learned this thing many a times. How do we know if a number is divisible by 3? A number is divisible by 3. A number is divisible by 3 if the sum of its digits is divisible by 3. A number is divisible by 3 if the sum of its digits is divisible by 3. We have learned this thing many times. What's the sum of this, uh, sum of the digits of 144? 1 plus 4 is 5, 5 plus 4 is 9. 144 is clearly divisible by 3. Let's divide top and bottom by 3, shall we? How many 3's in a 1? 1 has no 3's. Learn how to divide without a calculator, okay? Listen, you don't have to do it longhand. If you do it longhand, try to divide 144 longhand with, by 3 like a child in a childish manner, that will take a long time. Learn how to do it in a grown-up method. One more time. How many 3's in 0? Zero has no three. Zero, uh, oh, sorry, not zero. How many threes in a one? One has no threes. One is just one. It has no threes. So that one is going to go and joins four, becomes fourteen. One has no threes. You see, zero. One has zero threes. That one goes and joins the four, becomes fourteen. How many threes in fourteen? Now fourteen has four threes. Four threes are twelve. Cross out the fourteen and put down four. What happens to the remaining two? The remaining two goes and joins this guy becomes 28. How many threes in 28? Seven threes are 21. Seven eights are 24. There are eight. There are eight threes in 24. Since we divide the top by three, we have to divide the bottom by three. Can we go one more round? Why not? We can clearly see 4 plus 8 is 12. Since the sum of the digits of 48 is divisible by 3, since 12 is divisible by 3, 48 must be divisible by 3. Let's go one more round, shall we? Divide by 3. How many 3's in a 4? Four? 4 has 1 3. 4 has 1 3. 
The remaining one is going to go and join the 8 becomes 18. How many 3's in 18? 8, 6 are, uh, how many 3's in 18? 6 3's are 18. There are 6 3's in 18. That's it, we are done. That's it. 16 hours. It's going to take 16 hours, this guy is going to take 28.8 hours. That's all there is. And therefore the difference in the amount of time that they're going to take is 28.6. What can we do it here? 28, 28.8 rather, minus 16. It's going to be 0.2. This 7, 8 is going to become 7, so it's going to give a 1. Looks like 11.2. I come up with a difference of that is not correct, is it? Did I, did I make a boo-boo at the end, you see? 8. Oh, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I... Oh, Jesus. I'm not going to read that. I'm going to keep it here. I, I don't know what, what, what happened here. I'm going to keep it here as a, as, a, as a manifestation of my insanity. Understand? What should we do it? Let's do it here. 28. I really don't know what happened there. I think I, think I thought that L was down here and that 0 was up there. I think that's what happened. So this is just 8. Uh, 2. 12.8 is the answer. The final answer is 12.8 hours. The difference in their, because of the difference in their speed, uh, this guy who reaches a slower speed, A, is going to take about 13 hours longer than the first guy. That was it. Let's do the next one, shall we? Let's do the next one. As you can see, it's very easy to make mistakes in the exam, particularly when you're under pressure, which I'm not, as you can see, I'm very leisurely, I'm, I'm not in a rush. But when you are when you're taking the real exam and there is a time pressure, when you are under under intense pressure, it's even easier to make careless mistakes like I just did. I don't know what the hell I was doing. And if if one of the answer choices happens to be eleven, trust me, if one of the answer if they tell you the approximately what's the difference in the uh, in the number of hours that uh, these people are going to take approximately, and if they use the word approximately, then the answer choice of course thirteen is going to be the right answer. And if 13 is one of the answer choices, it's very likely that 11 is also going to be one of the answer choices precisely because of this reason. I still don't know what I did here. If you put 8 here, if you put 8 here and 0 here, then it is 2. Oh yes, that's exactly what I did. I, put, I, I switched the 8 and the 0 in my mind. Let's do the next one, shall we? So be careful. What you have to understand, I'm breaking into another sermon, what you have to understand is that there are four answer choices that you see in front of you. One of those four answer choices, of course, is the right answer. What you must understand is that in any standardized exam, which is what this is, this exam that you're taking is a standardized exam, and in any standardized exam, anywhere in the world, for anything at all, it doesn't matter whether you're taking the standardized exam to become a firefighter or a policeman or join the military or become a nurse or to get in the graduate school or to become a lawyer. It doesn't matter what you're, what you're taking the standardized exam for. As long as the exam is standardized, what I'm about to say applies to all standard, standardized exam equally, which is for, there are four answer choices. One of them, of course, is the correct answer. Where do the other three answer choices come from? They do not fall from the sky. They're not picked at random. Those three answer choices, the other three answer choices that you see there, are the three most popular mistakes. And if you happen to make one of those three most popular mistakes, then your answer will agree with one of the answer choices that they give you, and you will never know that you made a mistake. So if the 13 was, the, if they were asking approximately what's the difference in the amount of time that these people will take, the correct answer there was 13. And if 11 happened to be one of the answer choices, I would have never known that I made such a idiotic boo-boo. Do you understand? Now, idiotic boo-boo could be actually redundant. Couldn't be. Couldn't it? Of course it could. Very good. Let's do number one. Question number one, the practice questions on page 84 at the bottom there. Question number one is very straightforward. We are told that he travels 30 miles in two hours. 30 miles in two hours. Well, if he's going 30 miles in two hours, that implies that he must go 65 miles in one hour. And the question simply is, how far will he go in five hours? Well, in five hours, therefore, therefore, this means therefore, therefore, in five hours, he will go five times 65. 
5 times 65 miles. And how much is 5 times 65? Well, how the hell do I know? I know 10 times 65 is 650. That I do know. 10 times 65 is 650. Therefore, 5 times 65 must be half of 600 and half of 50. 325. 325 miles we will go in 5 hours. So that was one way. Another way to solve this question is to actually set it up as a proportion problem. Let's do it here. Let's set it up as a proportion problem. In a proportions question, you set it up as miles and hours. And we are told that he goes 130 miles in 2 hours. 130 miles, 2 hours. We are setting up the ratio as miles and hours. The question is how far will he go in 5 hours? And you just solve for x. So you cross multiply, you get 2x equals to 130 times 5. And therefore, x is going to be divided both sides by 2. And it's going to be exact same thing as before. Exact same thing as before. We divide 130. How many, how many, how many 2's in a 13? 13 has 6 2's. The remaining one goes and joins the 0 becomes 10. How many 2's in a 10? 10 has 5 2's. And 2 cancels out. And you end up exactly what we did here. 65 times 5. Right here we did 65 times 5. You see? Let's do the next one, shall we? Number 2. Problem number 2. Just give me one second. We need a break. Problem number two. In problem number two, they tell us that the club has nine males and 21 females. All right. Nine males and 21 females. <coughs> and they're looking for a ratio of male to female. So it's very important that you pay attention to what is being asked. Are they asking for, don't just assume just because the males are mentioned first in the problem, don't just assume that they're asking for the ratio of males to females. Sometimes they're looking for the ratio of, uh, ratio of females to males. And of course the reciprocal of the correct answer is going to be one of the answer choices. Here they're looking for, in fact, they are in fact looking for the ratio of males to females. So ratio, ratio of, ratio of male to female it's very straightforward. Males, there are there are nine. There are nine males and twenty-one females. But you cannot leave it like this. You're not going to find one of the answer choices in this form nine over twenty-one. It's not going to be there. You must reduce it. If it can be reduced, if a fraction can be reduced, it must be reduced. Of course, this fraction can be reduced. We can divide top and bottom by three. Let's do it, shall we? How many threes in a nine? Nine has three threes. How many threes in a twenty-one? 7 3's are 21, 21 has 7 3's. So the correct answer is going to be 3 over 7. What if they had asked us for the ratio of female to male? <coughs> ratio, ratio of female to male. But well, since we already done all the work, we don't have to do it, we don't have to redo all the work. It's just going to be 7 over 3. It's just going to be reciprocal. What if the question was looking for ratio of Ratio of male to total. Sometimes they ask you that. Well, ratio of male to total, there are nine males. And how many total people? 21 plus 9, 21 females, 9 males. Well, that gives us the grand total of 30. This is the ratio. Again, correct answer is not going to be 9 over 30. We cannot leave it like this. We are not going to find it there. We must reduce it. Divide top and bottom by 3. And we find that this is same as 10 over 3. What, what if they ask us for the ratio of female to total? Female to total. Again, since we have done this part already, of course in the real exam you wouldn't have done this thing, but since we have already done it, we already know the answer is going to be 7 over 10 because this was 3 over 10. But let's do it anyway. So 21 over 30, and we divide top and bottom by 3, we find that we get 7 over 10. 7 over 10. What if they were asking, what if they are, what, what if they were asking you that are the, what if they tell you that are, there are 9 males and 21 females, what what percentage of the total population is male? Well, what percentage of the total population is male? Males are 3 out of 10 or 30 percent. What percentage of the population is female? Of course it's 70 percent. Let's move on, shall we? Is there one more? There is one more, number 3. Number three, okay? Give me one second again. The, 
very last one on the page. It says the following amounts of beverages are needed to serve 72 people. We're going to serve 72 people. Serve 72 people with 4 gallons, we are told, of the punch, 3 gallons of lemonade, 2 gallons of tea for a grand total of 4 plus 3 is 7, 7 plus 2 is 9, 9 gallons. What is the question asking? What are they asking for? Okay, let's read one more time. The following amounts of beverages, I'm reading it from the book here verbatim. The following amount of beverages are needed to serve 72 people. 4 gallons of punch, 3 gallons of lemonade, 2 gallons of tea. We already took care of that. How many total gallons of these beverages are needed if you are to serve 240 people? Oh, we are not serving 72 people. The number of people that actually have to serve is 240. So we have to save this and set it up as a proportion problem. And proportions, as we know, deal with unlike things. Things cannot be added or subtracted. It is. It does make. It wouldn't make any sense. See, proportions deal with unlike things. Things, dissimilar things. Things. Things that cannot be added or subtracted. At the end of the problem, it will make no sense at all to go around asking. So, how much is three gallons plus five people? We cannot add gallons and people. They are two unlike things. They are two dissimilar objects. They cannot be added or subtracted, which is why it's called a proportion and not a ratio. Let's set it up. So we have gallons and people. Well, we already know that nine gallons are required to serve 72 people. Question is, how many gallons do we need to serve 240 people? We have to cross multiply and solve it. Let's do it over there, shall we? Where did this come from? I don't know where it came from. I have no idea. Must, must have been from yesterday. Let's cross multiply 9 times 240 equals 72 times x. So we're going to continue here. So 72x equals 9 times 240. And of course x will equal to 9 times 240 over 72. We divide both sides by 72. I'm not going to show you all the daily steps. That's it. Now do not sit there and multiply 9 by 20, 240. You will make your life miserable. Reduce as much as you can. You must multiply and divide the final answer when it is absolutely necessary, not before that. You must, you must keep on going, reducing things, and then at the very end, if you're done with everything and you're still left with 17 times 3, there is no other choice. Now we have to multiply 17 times 3 to figure out what the answer is. Here, of course, things can be reduced. Let's divide top and bottom by 3. How do we know if we can divide the bottom by 3? Well, we just, actually, I just erased it. We just learned uh, uh, that uh, if the sum of the digits is divisible by 3, then the number itself is divisible by 3. 7 plus 2 is 9. Since 9 can be divided by 3, 72 is divisible by 3. Let's divide top and bottom by 3, shall we? How many 3's in a 7? 7 has 2 3's. 2 3's are 6. The remaining one goes and joins the 2, becomes 12. How many 3's in a 12? 12 has 4 3's. 4 3's are 12. So 72 turns into 24, and 9 is going to turn into 3. Again, I see 2 and 4, 2 plus 4 is 6, and since 6 can be divided by 3, 24 is divisible by 3, which of course it is. It's very simple to see here. Let's divide. Oh, actually, I'm not going to do that actually. I changed my mind. I changed my mind mid-sentence. You know why? As I was saying here, I happen to notice that we have 240 and 24. What the hell? Let's divide, divide top and bottom by 24. Let's divide top and bottom by 24. 240 will become 10. Let's see if we're done. So the answer is 3 times 10. We're going to need... 30 gallons. We're going to need 30 gallons of beverage in order for us to be able to serve the number of people that we are told, which is 240 people. In order for us to be able to serve 240 people, based on the recipe that they gave given to us, we need a total of 30 gallons of booze. Oh, did I say booze? I meant beverage. Do you understand? I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.